I'm happy to be presenting at the PacBio ASHG workshop. My name is Aziz al Kafaji, and I'm a postdoc at the Broad Institute, co-advised by Nira Cohen and Paul Blaney. Today, I'm excited to present on a method that I and computational partners, uh, John Smith, Kieran Garmelia, and Martash Babadi have developed over the past two years for high-throughput RNA isoform sequencing. And it's titled uh, Multiplex Array Sequencing or MOSSEEQ. Before diving into methodological specifics, I first want to provide some quick background. Alternative splicing is a core regulatory process used by cells to diversify the function of genes. Um, during mRNA maturation, uh, exons and introns are differentially spliced, and this generates mRNAs that differ in their coding sequence and or uh, untranslated regions. Ultimately, this gives rise to uh, different protein isoform expression, changes in translation efficiency, mRNA stability, localization, and even reading frame changes. Uh, as well, it's estimated that greater than 90% of human genes undergo some level of alternative splicing. So it's very pervasive. Uh, as you may know, uh, there are countless examples of alternative splicing playing essential roles in development and homeostatic balance. And as well, when defective, aberrant splicing can contribute to many diseases, uh, even which include cancer. And so despite the essential role that isoforms play, our ability to resolve these genetic features is really quite limited. And the problem is illustrated here in this figure. We have our prototypical gene, gene X, which gives rise to multiple transcript X isoforms. Traditional short read sequences are uh, unable to accurately and unambiguously identify RNA isoforms due to their short read lengths, typically between 50 to 300 base pairs. And this is really insufficient to span the consecutive splice sites found within these transcripts. Um, conversely, we have long read approaches which simply read the length of the RNA or rather cDNA molecule and that enables unambiguous isoform identification. So to quantify the differences in isoform identification capability between short and long read sequencing, we leveraged a, a, a synthetic RNA isoform library called SERBS from, from Lexigen. And this synthetic library is composed of genes with their own sets of RNA isoforms. And what we can see here is using SmartSeq3, which is um, a kind of state-of-the-art short read sequencing uh, approach, there's considerable confusion in determining isoform identity between the different serve gene sets. Uh, and this is, this is in stark contrast to uh, a long read approach such as MOSSeq, which provides uh, unambiguous isoform assignment. So there really is a big difference uh, in identifying isoforms between short and long read sequencing. So, you know, while these long read approaches have the read lengths to accurately capture RNA isoforms, they have limited throughput necessary for many high power studies, uh, you know, including single cell and spatial RNA sequencing. And so now I'll briefly review isoform sequencing on the PacBio platform which should provide adequate context and motivation for the mechanism of MOSSEQ itself. So starting off, we have our library cDNA, uh, cDNAs, uh, from which we uh, ligate hairpin adapters, effectively circularizing the molecule. Uh, from there, uh, a sequencing by synthesis, uh, reaction takes place using a strand displacing polymerase. And this uh, causes a sequencing uh, around the molecule. And then when the polymerase reaches where uh, sequencing uh, initially started, it will actually displace that strand and continue to sequence in circular fashion. And uh, what this uh, does is it's called circular consensus sequencing where you get many subreads or passes that can then uh, be error corrected. Uh, and this produces um, 
very high quality sequencing. And so again, shown here on the x-axis, as the number of passes around this molecule increases, so does the base calling accuracy. After around 10 passes or so, you can begin to see that there's a steep drop off or plateau in the increase of base calling accuracy. So there's really diminishing returns once you get past 10 or so passes. And so as read lengths for the PacBio are in the range of 200 KB and the vast majority of transcripts are 5 KB and below, um, you know, we can see here in red, isoseq reads have greater than 60 passes. And so really these, these reads are getting over sequenced. And this is, uh, we can see this as wasted sequencing potential itself. So what if we could harness those extra passes, so to speak? So conversely, whole genome sequencing um, on the PacBio instrument, they can modulate the size of the, their input libraries uh, by sharing the genome and they target 20 KB fragments. And this gives the optimal balance of both output and base calling accuracy. And so as you'll see uh, here uh, in the library, um, the, uh, the pass number is somewhere around um, you know, 10, uh, or some below and, and a little above. And so uh, just another visual to, to really drive this idea home is here we have uh, our RNA isoform that's been prepped for um, PAC bio sequencing, and it's only 2 kb long. Uh, we can see this as having 18 kb of lost sequencing opportunity. So uh, this is uh, a segue into MOSSEQ itself. So to better take advantage of PacBio, I, I devised a method that programmatically links cDNAs into arrays of defined sizes. And these long cDNA arrays um, can then be sequenced and then demultiplexed into their individual cDNA component uh, pieces. Uh, and this effectively boosts the output uh, of your PacBio run by the number of cDNAs uh, assembled into the array. So here I'll quickly describe uh, the MOSSEQ workflow in a bit more detail. So you have your parent cDNA library of which you'll distribute into n number of parallel PCR reactions where n is the number of cDNAs you would like to put into your array. Um, the reactions are identical except for the adapters that are added onto uh, via primers and uh, amplification. So what you'll see here is this alphabetical overlapping uh, sequence where we have uh, adapters A and B added in PCR1. And for PCR2, we have B and C, C and D, D and E, so on and so forth. The other key thing to note here is that these primers have a deoxyuracil base modification in them, such that during amplification, again, all cDNAs will have their um, five prime and three prime adapters and a deoxyuracil uh, kind of uh, downstream of the adapter sequence itself. So after amplification, these fragments are pooled and then uh, deoxyuracil digestion using the user enzyme mix uh, that takes place. And what this does is it excises the DU here, and that causes this lower strand to melt away, uh, leaving exposed the adapter region. Well, this happens to all of the molecules, and what you end up doing is uh, revealing these complementary ends uh, you know, complement of B and B, complement of C and C, so on and so forth. And this drives strong and specific hybridization as these overlapping uh, adapter uh, uh, sequences are 15 bases long and they're programmed to have uh, a, a hamming distance of 11 uh, away from one another. So strong and specific hybridization. From there, uh, we perform a, a ligation to covalently link these um, cDNAs into an array, and then sequencing is performed. 
And shown here is uh, an actual um, MOSIC uh, 15 member array assembly from a parent uh, and including the parent cDNA. So here is our parent cDNA library. And we determined that uh, a 15 member array is the correct number of uh, cDNAs to link together to reach 20 KB. And uh, so uh, indeed we see that after uh, uh, array ligation, we're around 20 KB. And then when we sequence this library, indeed we see that MOSSEQ, uh, the, the past profile, strongly resembles uh, whole genome sequencing and is certainly uh, starkly different than ISOSeq itself. And so a surprising challenge that we ran into was efficiently and accurately demultiplexing the sequenced MOSSEQ arrays. Initial, additional, or sorry, initial uh, approaches failed due to noise sensitivity associated with the relatively short adapter sequences. Again, only 15 bases. And uh, this led to high rates of missegregation, uh, which you can imagine is a critical flaw when we're um, aiming to quantify and discover novel isoforms. It, it would masquerade as a potential fusion product or, or something. So given the highly structured nature of the MOSSEQ arrays, Kieran Garmelia developed Longbo, which is a hidden Markov model for array annotation and segmentation that uses the full context of the array, the sequential model with the different um, adapter landmarks when annotating the read itself. So Longbo does an amazing job at demultiplexing samples. We can see here from our adapter pair heat maps that the vast majority of arrays are properly formed. Um, and so how to read this heat map? Um, the columns here are our five prime adapters and the rows are our three prime adapters. And so if our five prime adapter is A, the cDNA fragment ends in a B. If our cDNA fragment starts at a B, it ends in a C, so on and so forth. And so any off diagonal signal would mean, let's say that it starts with an A, but ends in an M. That would be uh, obviously not programmed uh, in our molecules and, and would be very worrisome. But uh, we can see here that uh, almost all of our signal, in fact, 99.2% of our signal is along this diagonal. Uh, and so, uh, an amazing uh, thing came out of this. We realized that we could actually go into the CCS uncorrected reads and perform longbow on, on this much more noisy data. And to our surprise, around 52% of the CCS uncorrected data was actually able to segment properly using longbow. So we we're actually able to reclaim the CCS uncorrected reads, which again are typically thrown away. Uh, another thing uh, we did was to maximize pre precision um, reads that contained um, um, non-consecutive uh, array structure were filtered out. Uh, so to be precise here, um, we didn't only keep uh, arrays that started in A and ended in P. We allowed for arrays that had um, that kept sequential order no matter where it started or where it ended. So we were totally fine with keeping an array that started with F and went to O. What we didn't allow was skipping of a letter. So if we had an array that was A, B, skip C, and went to D, E, we threw that out because uh, we might have missegmented uh, this array. And so given that, uh, we can see here the length profile of our arrays for CCS corrected and uncorrected, uh, shown here in blue and orange, uh, respectively, for two different samples. So the majority or plurality of, of our arrays were fully formed, 15 rooms, but we certainly had a fair share of 14 and 13 and so forth. So uh, ultimately, MOSSEQ leads to a yield increase of 16 to 22 fold 
over CCS corrected read counts. And this is about 35 to 40 million reads per flow cell. And so uh, shown here is uh, a Sankey diagram breaking down metrics um, from, from, from the MOS seq runs. Looking at sample one, we can see that we have 5 million input reads, uh, of which about half were corrected. Uh, and this is, this is typical. And then of that, it went through our long flow filters and then demultiplexed. And we can see here that we got a boost of 12 fold and an output of around 30 million reads. As well, uh, we're able to uh, perform a long flow on the CCS uncorrected reads, which we, again, we recovered around half. And then uh, we demultiplexed. We got a four fold boost above CCS corrected reads. Uh, and got a total output of 10 million. Um, and so um, these reads, they are lower base quality, certainly, but that we're still able to map these reads just fine. And we're able to identify cell barcodes uh, from a whitelist for um, pairing with a single cell um, uh, data workflows. So now let's dive into some MOSSEQ single cell RNA isoform analysis. Uh, a very active area of research centers around understanding T cell dysfunction in the context of cancer uh, with the aim of developing therapeutic strategies to reinvigorate the immune system against cancers. And so a close collaborator, Moshe, performed 10X genomics uh, on a single cell gene expression on uh, tumor infiltrating CD8 T cells, from which full length uh, cDNA libraries were processed for both Illumina sequencing and for MOSSEQ. And uh, this shows uh, the runs from the short read and long read uh, workflows. Uh, we can see here that um, the cell embeddings and clusterings are highly concordant. Um, uh, and the short read sequencing had much greater read depth. Um, as well, uh, we can see that we were able to recapitulate um, all the different uh, uh, present cell states within uh, these populations of, of T cells. On the left, we have our stem-like memory cells leading to our early activated uh, subpopulations leading into, in pink here, our cytotoxic effectors. And then ultimately, terminally differentiated or exhausted uh, T cells. And finally, up here, we have our proliferating cells. We took advantage of the distinct CD45 splicing patterns known to be present across different CD8 T cell subpopulations to validate MOSSEQ's capacity to resolve RNA isoforms. So, shown here are the different uh, CD45 RNA isoforms of interest. Uh, the key exons here are four, five, and six, which correspond to uh, exon A, B, and C. So we can see here the uh, top isoform is CD45 RABC. Uh, this next isoform is CD45 RAB. And uh, traveling down to the end, we have our CD45 RO, which skips exons A, B, and C. Uh, and so in addition to CD45 um, analysis using MOSSEQ, we as well did an orthogonal protein measurement um, called SiteSeq, which uses antibody tags. And specifically these um, were specific for total CD45, CD45RA and CD45RO. And so I'll go over the site seek data first. Um, we can see our total expression is fairly uniform throughout uh, the population. CD45RA um, uh, site seek was uh, rather specific to the stem like in early activated cell states, whereas CD45RO was more specific to the cytotoxic effector in, in more terminally differentiated cell states. Um, 
And so that's pretty amazing. You know, we're able to see some uh, uh, splicing texture where if you're just to read total, uh, you, you, you know, it, it's very uniform. Um, so now to go over the, the Mossy uh, analysis, uh, and, you know, we see that Mossy recapitulates these site seek findings. Um, however, Mossy has greater isoform specific resolution. So we see that we, um, again, recapitulate the CD45 RO uh, expression pattern, you know, being mostly on the right side of this, this UMAP toward the more differentiated uh, uh, side. Um, CD45 RA, uh, again, a similar pattern um, where uh, it's present more in the undifferentiated stem-like uh, subpopulations. But here we're actually able to differentiate between CD45 RAB and RABC, which certainly have different subpopulation uh, presence in, in, our, in our data. And this is uh, an interesting thing to note. Um, you know, this site seek is, is an antibody based measurement which uh, targets a particular epitope. Um, so while it can bind to um, RA, it cannot discriminate the presence of exons B and BC. And as well, uh, we're able to capture uh, CD45 uh, RB and RBC, which uh, we didn't have uh, an antibody available. For for uh, for this analysis, so um, yeah, um, much better uh, capture when it comes to isoform specificity with MOSSeq. So next, we leverage pseudo time analysis to visualize the progression of CD45 splicing over the course of T cell differentiation. On this force directed graph, we can see the sequence of differentiation uh, in, in, in pseudo time where we have our stem-like memory leading to our early activated, then early exhausted cytotoxic effectors, and then terminally differentiated. Shown here is the uh, clear progression of CD45 class switching over the course of pseudo time. And notably, uh, we uh, observe the monotonic increase of the key um, CD45 splicing factor, HNRN and PLL, um, along pseudotype as well. So this is a, a you know, very confirmatory uh, to, to our results and, and really shows the power of being able to um, identify splice patterns and then be able to look up the splicing factors that are implicated uh, in the processing of those mRNAs. Finally, through downsampling studies, we quantified the added value of MOSSEQ throughput gains in terms of clustering capability and differential splicing discovery. As compared to ISOSEQ uh, read depths, we observed a 44% increase in clustering accuracy uh, as, uh, as measured by the adjusted RAND index. Uh, as well, we see a 34-fold increase in discovery of differentially spliced genes going from 47 all the way to 1600. Um, and so these metrics clearly highlight the impact breed depth has on clustering and discovery of differentially spliced genes. So in summary, MOSSEQ is a streamlined workflow that enables 35 to 40 million isoform leads per flow cell. This is compatible with most protocols that generate full length cDNA. As well, this is compatible with existing 10x cDNA libraries, you know, hanging out in the freezer. Um, and uh, yeah, a single uh, flow cell is sufficient to provide statistical power for key downstream tasks, such as embedding, clustering, and identification of differentially spliced isoforms. Uh, yeah, and so so many people to uh, acknowledge and, and thank, uh, of course, Nia Cohen and Paul Blaney for being uh, amazing and supportive uh, advisors. Uh, like you know, the computational partners uh, that were just so essential and such a joy to work with um, from the data sciences platform, John Smith, Karen Garmelia, and Murtash Babadi. Um, CC Sarsikova and Victoria Popic for uh, their amazing uh, 
computational discussions and you know centered around this data analysis it was very tricky. Um, Mark Schwartz uh, for you know discussions around the T cell uh, data analysis, Moshe and uh, Genevieve for providing samples, the genomic platform for uh, helping us develop and, and sequence all of these runs. And of course, uh, our funding sources, the Spark, AMRF, and, and so on. Uh, and for conflicts of interest, um, uh, the Broad Institute and MIT have uh, patent applications filed uh, on the work described here, and as well as some other considerations. Uh, yeah, and thank you. If you if you have any questions, feel, please feel free to reach out uh, to my address here, and we should have a bio archive coming out soon. And uh, thank you. <laughs>